first way that the CS70M is better than the CS80 is it has stereo oscillator output. In the CS80, both the left and right channels were identical, aka mono, unless you turn the chorus or tremolo effect on. The CS70M actually has a complete synth voice, that's a VCO, VCF, and VCA going to each channel left and right separately. So here's how the CS70M sounds with mixed output, that's both synth voices going through one output like it would have on the CS80. Make sure you're listening in stereo with either good speakers or headphones, otherwise this is going to sound exactly the same. And here is how it sounds in stereo. sounds more CS80 than a CS80. This one feature alone is so incredible that it makes the CS70M the Nexus 9 to the CS80's Nexus 6. This binaural synthesizer feature is something I haven't seen in analog synthesizers until very recently with synths like the Udo Super 6. The CS70M has a polyphonic sequencer, which would have been impossible four years before when the CS80 came out. And it couldn't be easier to use. We just select one of these four patterns, and I'm gonna start with just A. And when you hit the record button, it's gonna wait for your first note played to start recording. So let's put down a quick little bass line. And if I hit play, it'll play through that once. Or I can hit repeat and then it'll just loop that. And while it's looping, we can adjust the tempo or use this X2 button so that we can double the tempo. And now, while that's playing, we can adjust any of the front panel controls and make changes to that. And while that's playing back, we can also play notes over it, so... If we select pattern B here, we can record into that pattern and have something else here, so... And now, when we play back A and B, it'll chain those two patterns together. If I was good at keys, I could have recorded polyphonically into the sequencer, by the way. The problem is, the only thing I'm worse at than playing keys is adhering to mercerism. So for those of us who aren't good at playing live, we can use CV only to step sequence record. So now I can play polyphonically or monophonically. And each time I hit the CV only button, that saves what I just played as a step. And I can add rests by just pressing the button again while playing nothing. And just like before, we can hit repeat, press play, and adjust any parameter we want while the sequencer is playing back polyphonically, as well as add additional notes that weren't there in the sequence. It's better than nice. The CS70M not only has a unison mode not present on the CS80, it also has splits. Here's how the synth sounds normally. And here's how it sounds in unison. 
This sounds absolutely monstrous. We could also split this and have two voices on the left and four on the right. Or vice versa. And in addition to the balance slider that we have from the ZS80, we also have a split balance slider that lets us control the relative levels there. Which is super helpful for getting those splits volumes right. Gosh, the CS70M has some real nice toys here. Real quick, if you're enjoying the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out. I know you're probably tired of hearing this from YouTubers, but it makes a huge difference getting these videos out to more people. So by hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel, not only are you gonna see more of my videos in your feed, but it's also telling the algorithm to put my videos out to a wider audience. So it would mean a lot to me if you would like and subscribe. Thank you guys very much. Let's get back to the video. Unlike the fixed filter architecture of the CS80, the CS70M has a switchable filter which can move between 12 decibel per octave, low pass, high pass, and band pass filters. The CS80 actually had two filters per voice, a high pass filter and a low pass filter that's controlled by the same envelope both of which were 12 decibel per octave and resonant, but not fully resonant. That is, you can't get a note out of the filter when you don't have an oscillator running through it. The CS70M's filter is the same as the low pass filter under the hood, but it's configured to output band pass and high pass as well. The high pass and band pass pads the CS70M can produce put the CS80 to shame, not because the filter is inherently better, but because the envelopes are better. The CS70M removes the confusing initial level and attack level sliders and instead replaces them with a standard ADSR that's invertible. That's super important because with high pass pads, you often need to have an inverted envelope shape. And even though those initial level and attack level sliders could be configured in a certain way to sort of get a little bit of an inverted shape, the range wasn't very far and it's affecting the low pass and the high pass filter at the same time. With the CF70M, you get true inverted envelopes, which are critical to nailing that sound. And my God, does it sound amazing. <laughs> An angel should never enter the kingdom of heaven without a gift. It's really the high pass filter that shines here because you could put the cutoff of the high pass and the low pass to the same value in the CS80 and get a band pass filter, but you cannot even get close to the high pass sounds you can get with a CS70M on a CS80. One of the features that makes it hard for me to tell if I'm a replicant or a lesbian is the Timex 5 button, which multiplies the length of the ADSR envelopes by five. With the button off, the envelopes are very snappy, especially the exponential attack, which really doesn't shave that much off the front end of a sound. It's really good for woodwinds and brass when you want to take off just the little attack of the sound. But with the Time X5 button on, you can create some truly evolving soundscapes worthy of the off-world colonies. <laughs> Instant massive soundscapes. The CS80 actually only has one LFO for both of its synth voices, although it can create pulse width modulation. The CS70M actually has two LFOs, a channel LFO and a global LFO. On the CS70M, we can still do pulse width modulation, but we can also apply the channel LFO to the VCF, the VCA, and the VCO. Also have it affect just one channel if we want so in this case we could use it for some pulse width modulation and some modulation of the VCO and we haven't even 
touched the global LFO yet. CS70M also borrows the EG depth, attack time, and decay time of the ring modulator of the CS80. And that's how you can get those beautiful breathing dynamic LFO sounds. We could apply that to the filter as well. And get some wicked filter FM. And of course, this type of thing was not possible on the CS80. The CS70M has a sample and hold LFO, which was conspicuously absent from the CS80. The initial pitch bend effect from the CS80 has been replaced with glide plus or glide negative LFO shapes. This allows for positive and negative pitch bending at the start of every note that was not possible on the CS80. We can use a little attack time as well to sort of simulate a Hoover type sound. Or we could use glide negative, which is more like the initial pitch bend of the CS80. might not be obvious is you can use glide plus and glide negative to affect more than the pitch of the oscillator. And so we can use glide plus and glide negative actually as additional envelopes to do sound design in ways that you could never do on the CS80. An example of this is routing glide to pulse width so that you can change the pulse width of a sound with an envelope. which can sound just absolutely gorgeous. It almost has a high pass type sound to it. Guide Plus can be the same thing, but the opposite. Also very cool. A lot of the later synths in the 80s had complex six-stage envelopes like the DX7, D50, SQ80, and DW8000. By combining the Glide Plus or negative envelopes with the standard envelopes in the VCF or VCA, you can create these complex envelopes on the CS70M that are impossible to do on the CS80. <laughs> The CS70M has the ring modulator from the CS80. But ring modulation is now a modulation source, so we can also route it to pulse width and the filter. So here's how it sounds with pulse width modulation. send it to the filter as well for some really crazy tones.
on the CS80, the pulse width of the square wave goes from 50% to 90%, meaning it doesn't go through 100% or zero where it cancels out. It's the same on the CS70M to start with, but the LFO can actually push that pulse width even further, creating some really interesting rhythmic effects that you couldn't do with a CS80. <laughs> The CS70M also has a fine tune control for the LFO, so you can really dial in those tempo differences on the CS70M that wouldn't be possible on the CS80, at least not easily. The CS80 did not have pitch or modulation wheels. In fact, it only had a very small dinky split knob that allowed you to adjust the coarse or fine pitch of the instrument. The CS70M has two really smooth, wonderful pitch and modulation wheels that just feel amazing. The maximum of the pitch wheel can be set to a third, a fifth, or an octave off of this switch here, which is really wonderful. <laughs> The modulation wheel is routed to the global LFO, which can affect either both voices, one channel, or the second channel. And because you can route the modulation wheel only to the second channel, and the channel LFO only to the first, you can create some truly amazing stereo effects. Incredibly wide. On the CS70M, aftertouch can be routed to the LFO modulation of the VCA. On the CS80, aftertouch modulation could only be routed to the VCO or VCF. <laughs> Before you go below the video to drop a Neander Wallace-esque comment, I'm not saying that you couldn't route the LFO to the VCA and the CS80. I'm saying you couldn't route aftertouch modulation to the amount of the LFO to the VCA in the CS80. And you can do that in the CS70M. Here's another improvement. The CS70M has a three bucket brigade delay analog ensemble effect, which is perfect for those Blade Runner string sounds, a la the Roland VP330. <laughs> The CS80 only had a single bucket brigade chorus effect, which many have lamented was nothing to write home about. The CS70M has a tremolo effect like the CS80, but unlike the CS80, they added a little button that lets it gradually increase in speed, and then if you press the button again, the tremolo effect lowers in speed, which is really fun. <laughs> in the CS70M name actually stands for memory. All of the CSM series synths have digital patch memory that wasn't possible on the earlier CS synths. The CS80 had 16 uneditable presets that were not modifiable in any way except by the ring modulator, global LFO, and brilliance, the basically the section at the bottom of the synth. The CS80 only had four editable presets and they were vocified versions of the interface underneath the hood in the upper left hand corner. Super short throw sliders that were very difficult to actually get to match how the synth was in manual mode, but it was okay in a pinch. Digital memory didn't exist yet. The only time you could actually use all of these sliders on the synthesizer was when you were all the way on the right on manual mode. And there was no way to directly save whatever sound you'd made on manual mode to the synthesizer. You'd have to go in with some tweezers and adjust those sliders under the hood. The CS70M has 30 fully editable presets and you can edit them after you save them. And by using these presets, we can do the LA synthesis thing a la the JX-10 or D-50, where we have two different sounds, one that makes up the attack portion of a sound, 
using the ring modulator here. And then we can have the sustain of the sound over here on channel two. And together we can create a really dreamy analog piano sound. Really gorgeous. What's also awesome about the CS70M is unlike most synthesizers from the 80s that had digital patch memory, which required a little battery soldered onto the motherboard, those batteries loved to leak over the years because they weren't really made to last and that battery acid can just eat a motherboard alive and then you have a dead synth. So all of those synthesizers have been lost in time like tears and rain. Instead, the CS70M has a little section underneath the headphone jack where you can put three AA batteries in and that's what it uses to store its patch memory. So you don't have any risk of those batteries leaking all over the motherboard. They also created a magnetic card interface where you stick a magnetic card into the synth and you can pull the preset off of it. And they sold a wallet of these magnetic cards, which also had blank ones for your own presets. And this greatly expanded the number of presets the synthesizer could come with and encouraged you to make your own sounds. We're not computers, we're physical. Yamaha wanted to get away from the standard at the time, which was actually to use cassette tapes to store presets. One of the hugest quality of life features of the CS70M is the auto-tune function button. Tuning the CS80 was an absolute nightmare where you had to open the synthesizer up and you've got a stack of 16 voice cards and each one of those has to be tuned individually with these little trim pots. On the CS70M, it's as simple as hitting this auto-tune button. To quote Mark Vale, if your CS80 is transported in an upright position with its rear panel pointing to the floor, you may start your journey with a machine that's in tune, but you definitely won't end with one. One of the biggest differences of the Yamaha CS80 to the CS70M is the weight. A CS80 with its built-in case weighs a whopping 180 pounds. If you get hurt moving it, I'm not paying for that. The CS70M actually only weighs 64 pounds or roughly a third the weight of a Yamaha CS80. And I can confirm that this is by far the heaviest synthesizer I've ever had in my hands. It's heavy enough that it was hard to get up on that stand there by myself. By the way, the name CS in CS80 actually stands for Compact Synthesizer, which is incredibly ironic. The CS70M actually has a couple of connections that weren't on the rear panel of the CS80, including a solo CV and trigger out, so you can actually play other synths from the CS70M, as well as a connector that lets you play the CS70M from a Yamaha SK30 or SK50D. The CS80 had an expression pedal you could buy that when you hit the expression wah button on the synth would actually adjust the filter, resonance, and volume all at once, so it sort of sounded like a wah-wah pedal a la Jimi Hendrix. The CS70M actually has ports for three separate expression pedals so you can control the volume, the filter cutoff, and the modulation amount separately, which is super cool. I have this expression pedal plugged into the brilliance control on the back of the CS70M, and of course that's routed to both of the filter cutoffs. So you can see that by using this we can get some really numinous pad sounds. The CS70M has a slider which adjusts the variable amount of sustain with or without using a sustain pedal to turn that on or off, whereas on the CS80 you just had an on or off button for sustain. <laughs> On the CS70M, the VCF level slider was omitted, and this makes a lot of sense because it was completely redundant on the CS80 because you can turn the oscillators off and the noise all the way down, and it's the exact same thing as if you turned the VCF off. Also on the CS70M, you can turn the output on the rear panel jacks off if you just want to use the headphones output. Finally, the biggest difference between the CS80 and the CS70M is the price. 
As of the recording of this video, the cheapest CS80 on reverb right now is a jaw-dropping $70,000. The cheapest CS70M right now is a relatively reasonable $17,000. So buy yourself something nice with that extra money. Once you start carving up that juicy bacon kid, the taste never goes away. Now to head off the comment section, here's a list of differences that would cause the CS70M to fail a void comp test. First, here's the obvious ones. No polyphonic aftertouch. The CS70M only has monophonic aftertouch or channel aftertouch, meaning that the aftertouch affects all of the notes, not individual notes like on the CS80. But I can't pick that apart note for note, so if I apply pressure on the left hand side, it's going to affect the note on the right hand side as well. The CS60 and the CS50 also only have channel aftertouch, making the CS80 the only CS synth that has polyphonic aftertouch. And I think it's fair to say that that is the defining feature of the CS80, that expressiveness you get from polyphonic aftertouch. And so for some people, nothing but a CS80 will do. All of the courage in the world cannot alter fact. Also missing is the ribbon controller from the CS80, which I think is the most interesting way to interact with the pitch of a synthesizer of all time. You could use the ribbon controller for trills and pitch bending, as well as massive dive bomb pitch slams that were only possible on the CS80 and the CS60. So if that's a feature you really need, that might be the synth for you. The CS60 only has one oscillator per voice though, so you're not going to get that rich CS80, CS70M sound of two detuned oscillators per voice. Because the architecture of the CS70M is so similar to the CS80, I still think it is the poor man's choice for a CS80 sound. Shockingly, there are no velocity or keyboard tracking controls on the CS70M at all. This is a heartbreaking omission, especially considering Yamaha's reputation for making expressive and dynamic instruments. In Vangelis's words, the CS80 is the only synthesizer I could describe as being a real instrument, mainly because of the keyboard, the way it's built, and what you can do with it. Now with a Neova ring controller and a Kenton MIDI kit installed into my CS70M, I've largely been able to get around some of those issues, but it's still crazy to me that Yamaha didn't build this into the synth from from the start. Then again, it's a very 80s omission when you consider that most of the legendary analog polysynths like the Jupiter 8, Prophet 5, Juno 6, and Oberheim OBX, none of those synthesizers came with velocity. So maybe that was just kind of the zeitgeist of the era. You newer models are happy scraping the shit because you've never seen a miracle. Another obvious difference is that the CS70M has only one set of knobs and sliders per voice, whereas the CS80 had discrete knobs for both of the synth voices. But that doesn't mean that you can't still get really great dual voice sounds like the LA synthesis of the D50. You can still pick different presets and because they're so easy to edit, you can actually edit each voice individually as you're going. If you have both manual mode buttons in, the knobs and switches affect both synth voices, but it's very easy to save one of those sounds to a preset and then you can continue editing to create another very different sound for the lower layer and then you could go back and edit the previous layer and modify that that to get it to fit in better. It's all very flexible and intuitive. This is not a big deal at all. It's very fast and honestly the fact that you can edit both synth voices together initially and then break them apart and edit them separately I think is probably faster than having to do that with two sets of faders. Here's another difference. The CS70M has six bitambral voices instead of the eight of the CS80. 99% of the time, I don't even think you're going to notice because six voices is more than enough. And I think this was actually a very smart place for Yamaha to cut costs to bring the price down of the CS70M because the 16 voice cards on the CS80 were total overkill. I think it made the CS70M more competitive in terms of price and it still had one more voice than a Prophet 5. Here's some more subtle differences that might not be obvious on the first glance, but do complicate the CS70M's identity crisis worse than an origami unicorn. On the CS80, you had individual sliders for how much of the LFO control voltage you wanted to send individually to the VCO, the VCF, and the VCA. On the CS70M, you just have switches, and that is brutal because the amount of control voltage you need to send to the VCF or VCA to hear a 
reasonable amount of modulation is a lot more than you would want to send to the oscillator because if you want to create a vibrato sound you usually need a very subtle amount of control voltage to get that pitch to waver nicely so although this amount of modulation depth sounds good on the vcf <laughs> It sounds great. The moment I want to send some voltage to the oscillator so we can get some vibrato going, it's pretty much useless. And there's no way around that. We could send it only to one of the two voices. We kind of want to dial that back and it's only going to one voice. You can kind of get around this issue. But you'll hear that that vibrato is still pretty dramatic. And the terrible thing is, is because this slider, like most of the sliders on the CS70M, is digitally controlled, so it's still all analog under the hood, but the value of it is digitally controlled so it can be saved in the preset memory. Because of that, the smallest value you can have <laughs> So you can see right there is on the cusp of the first value you can have. And it's so dramatic. There's no way to get a subtler vibrato sound than that. It's so seasick. I have no idea how this oversight left the factory. How can it not know what it is? Unless you get one of these Neova rings and route it into the CS70M through a Kenton MIDI kit, then you can have very fine control over vibrato. But as it left the factory, I feel like the vibrato is fundamentally broken in the CS70M. I feel like Leon Kowalski contemplating upside down turtles over here. Another gripe of mine is like the LFO, the cutoff frequency is digitally controlled, meaning that as you move that fader, you will hear the stepping through different values. And it is just such a grating sound at high resonance. <laughs> Now the good thing is, is under the hood, it's all still analog. So the envelopes and LFOs are not stepping. They're very smooth as butter. But when you're just playing around with the synth, it's very noticeable those differences in filter cutoff as you step through those values. Why don't you buy yourself a lollipop CS70M, something else to suck on? Another travesty for those of us who are looking for that Vangelis sound out of a CS synthesizer, there is no way to route Aftertouch to brilliance or level. A massive part of the Blade Runner brass sound, as well as many sounds on the CS80, is that as you apply pressure to Aftertouch, it opens opens up that filter and becomes gorgeous. And unfortunately, that's just not possible on the CS70M. Nothing is worse than having an itch you can never scratch. And again, not to sound like a broken record, but you can use one of these to get around this issue. Here's something I simply cannot understand. The CS80 had two synth voices, but it mixed it to mono, so the left and right channels were identical unless you turn the chorus or tremolo on. 
The CS70M is the exact opposite, where both voices can be routed left and right, which sounds huge and amazing, but if you turn the ensemble or tremolo on, it's mono. Why in the world would they have the synthesizer go mono with an ensemble effect? Now I will give it this, the ensemble effect is much more of like a string machine type sound inspired by synthesizers like the Roland VP330, which Vangelis used on the Blade Runner soundtrack. And that of course was a mono output synth. So the CS70M being able to capture that sound, it, I guess it is more classic if it is mono, but I can't for the life of me understand why the designers wouldn't embrace the inherently stereo nature of the CS70M when they designed these effects. I mean, that's like the point of a chorus effect on 99% of synths is to take a mono signal and make it stereo. So why in a stereo synth would you make it mono? You wake up one day and find it's all been a dream, or you wake up and discover that you've been asleep all the time and the nightmare is real. And finally, here are some differences that are neutral or minor enough they don't really bother me. Nothing that the god of biomechanics wouldn't let you into heaven for. The CS70M has only one filter per voice, whereas the CS80 had two, a high pass and a low pass filter. And so if you want to do a band pass sound on the CS80, you can actually space those resonant peaks apart. And so technically you can get certain sounds on the CS80 that aren't possible on the CS70M. Having said that, the envelopes are so much more flexible on the CS70M that for high pass and band pass sounds, I don't think I could live without them. And I wouldn't want to go back to the way the CS80 was doing it. And there's so many cool sounds the CS70M can do because of those envelopes that aren't possible on the CS80. So that's not really a negative to me. If it's a benefit, it's not my problem. Here's another oddity. The ring modulation in the synthesizer only affects channel one, not channel two. So if you're using the synth in stereo mode, it's on the left channel. And that's true even though you can use the ring mod as a source for pulse width or filter modulation. And they disabled the modulation depth control, so there's no way to mix the ring mod amount. This design choice really perplexed me, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in mono mode, where both of the synth voices are mixed to one channel like the CS80, you can just use the channel slider to sort of be like a mix control for the ring modulator. And that's actually how it worked on the CS80. But both channels did go into the ring modulator on the CS80 and you just had a mix control. So in some sense, it's more flexible on the CS70M because you could have two different sounds, one that is and one that isn't modulated by the ring modulator. But it's just weird to me. Again, this fits into sort of the chorus tremolo thing where it's like, why didn't they embrace the stereo nature of the synthesizer? Maybe they didn't think it was that big of a deal kind of one of those funny like oversights of history thing like in hindsight you would always want to have like the most stereo sound you could but there weren't any other synths that I'm aware of that could do this at that time Considering the mono output is the only option on the CS80, this really isn't even a negative. I'm just saying that it's hard to go from the stereo wide open expanse of the CS70M back to the mono-ness of the CS80 with the ring modulator. Now, luckily, there's one feature that really mitigates this problem, which is that the LFO can act as a ring modulator by routing it to the VCA, and it has the same controls as the ring modulator did on the CS80. Essentially, a ring modulator just is an LFO being applied to the amplifier. So for most of those beautiful cascading pad sounds you could get on the CS80 using the ring modulator, you can get those same sounds by using the LFO to the amplifier on the CS70M. The only thing that's a little tough to do in stereo are those atonal metallic ring modulator sounds. For those types of sounds, you probably want to put it into mono mode like on the CS80 because otherwise it just doesn't sound right. It's like the ring mods all over here on the left side of your head. It's, it's weird. The LFO just doesn't go quite fast enough to get into that atonal ring modulator territory. Here's a minor thing. The CS80 had a reversed saw LFO shape and a noise LFO shape. Now the reverse saw would have been cool to have on the CS70M so you could do pumping side chaining esque effects with the LFO. But aside from that, it's not that useful and I do use a regular saw much more often. I don't think removing the noise source for the LFO was a terrible omission. I don't think I would use it that often. But I would take sample and hold any day over just a noise source for the LFO. Considering it's a give and take between the CS80, whether you get the sample and hold of the 70 or the noise of the 80, I would take sample and hold any day of the week. 
You also have no external input on the rear panel that you can use as a source for the modulation for the LFO like you had on the CS80. Again, very minor stuff here. And finally, the last difference I can come up with, there's no global resonance slider on the CS70M, which is something I can't imagine ever using anyways. But it's not there and I felt the need to say it. The CS80 was released by the Japanese company Yamaha, which is the largest manufacturer of musical instruments in the world in 1977. The CS80 was only manufactured to 1980. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long and the CS80 burns so very, very brightly. I've heard different numbers, but somewhere between 850 and 2000 CS80s were made. In 1979, they sold for $6,900, which was a staggering amount of money. $6,900 in $1977 is $35,000 in inflation adjusted dollars today. The CS70M's incept date is 1981, picking up right where the CS80 left off. They continued making CS70Ms till 1983 when the Yamaha DX7 came out and Yamaha went all in on digital synthesizers. Interestingly, the CS70M is made from almost the same parts as the CS80 under the hood. The oscillators, filter, and amplifiers are almost identical and most of the time you can actually swap the parts in and out of a CS80 and CS70. The only major difference is the CS70M's oscillators were improved, that way they could use the auto-tune function. It was hard for me to find the exact price of of the CS70M in 1981 US dollars. In Japan, they went for 890,000 yen, and in the UK, they went for 3,800 pounds, which would have been about $16,000 in today's money, which is roughly half the price of a CS80. Half as much, but twice as elegant, sweetheart. According to Vintage Synthesizer Solutions, it's likely that less than 1,000 CS70Ms were ever made. And with both of these synthesizers, relatively few of the ones that were made have survived to today, making them some of the rarest synthesizers on the planet. It. It's a shame they didn't all live, but then again, who does? And that's the CS70M. I bought this particular CS70M from Vintage Standards in Japan. Really nice guy, smooth transaction, packed bulletproof. Would highly recommend, his link is in the description. I think this synthesizer has lived in the shadow of its older sibling for far too long. And I hope that I've shown you what an underrated synthesizer it is and how special it is in its own right. Now a synthesizer like this is not cheap. But if you watch the video that's on the screen right now, you'll see my top five picks for underrated vintage synthesizers that sound amazing. You can still buy at a bargain and they're going up in price. So please hit that video and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much. I'm Vulture Culture.